Hello everybody and welcome back to Brewmasters where we're talking to accomplished homebrewers for D&D 5th edition. Today we're speaking with Kaim, the homebrewer that you've probably never heard of but has helped consult on a number of projects critiquing and balancing with his encyclopedic knowledge of 5th edition while also taking on commissions for just about any brew you can think of. Even I had no idea to the extent of his involvement in a number of projects that I thought I was well acquainted with, so very excited to talk to him. But before we go to that though, I just want you to know that this episode is obviously coming out a month later than usual, and I wanted to take a moment to explain what's been going on and make a bit of an announcement. Part of the delay has been due to illness, but also because I've been making some tough decisions regarding 5th edition. See, I mean, I've been fighting with 5e for the longest time, and trying to brew my way out of things that I didn't like about this version of the rules. After some lengthy discussion with my very patient friends, and through the course of these very interviews, uh, I've made the choice to step away from 5e and just let it be what it is, an addition that I don't really like very much. You see, I've always enjoyed the complexity of 3.5, but appreciated the simplicity of 5e. And trying to blend those two has always been this impossible task, which has led me down the road of circular logic and frustration for a, a very long time now. So for my own sanity, I'm setting out on a new journey to try and find my true RPG love in a brand new series called System Scan. You see, I want to try as many new RPGs as I can find, from massively popular ones to deeply obscure stuff on Itch.io. And along the way, I'll be giving you my impressions of the one-shots that I run with them, and hopefully give you some insight into the wonderful world of tabletop RPGs that exist beyond the sunny shores of Dungeons & Dragons. Don't worry though, I've also been recording a lot of Brewmaster episodes, uh, featuring some fantastic brewers, with a greater focus on conversations around 5e analysis and design critique, rather than being stuffy point-by-point -point breakdowns of someone's existing work, um, as episodes have been in the past. So lastly, as we go forward, I'm also interested in taking the leap that they all said was coming, and I have an idea for my own tabletop role-playing game. And as someone who's never made one, I'd like to bring you all along for the journey. Uh, so this other series I have planned is called Cyberscape. Uh, we'll be documenting me going through and trying to build a tabletop role-playing game from scratch, so you can see how it's done and... Uh, see all the wonderful mistakes I make, trials and tribulations as I'm working on it. Uh, hopefully it'll inspire some of you to start going out there and making your own stuff. Um, obviously it's not going to be an easy journey or a quick one, so I'm excited to see where it'll go. So in summary, two new series, System Scan and Cyberscape, but Brewmasters will go on. And if that sounds exciting to you, then feel free to hit the like button, subscribe, and make a grapple check against that bell icon so you don't miss out on any of these upcoming shows on the channel coming soon. And with that out of the way, let's get on with the interview. Great to have you on the show. Uh, how are you doing today, man? Yeah, I'm doing terrible. It's 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, work, I have work in six hours. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no, it's cool, dude. Um, the thing is that I'm, I I went out of my way to sleep for this, so I already have my eight hours of sleep. Oh, that's much appreciated. Yeah, yeah, I I I prepared for this because I'm used to. Okay, so when I DM, right? When I DM, I DM for like groups of twenty. Wow. Um, split into four parties of four or five. How do you do that? So I I when I DM, I I run a session four times a week. And I have to wake up at 6 a.m. to do that or earlier. Wait, so you have 20 people all in the house at the same time and you like rotate them in parties of four? 20 people. No, 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 no. In, it's, it's a digital. I, I don't role play in real life, especially not now because of COVID. <laughs> so what happens is um, I, it's, it's just four. It's, it's like four separate games that are all taking place in the same setting. You see? So it populates the setting because there's 20 people in one setting. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. And then they all they all play in the same setting, so their actions affect each other, so on and so forth. But what that means is that I role play, I, I DM four times a week when I'm DMing, <laughs> and that's four four hour sessions. That's sixteen hours. That's almost half of a an actual full time job at that point. And that's why I only DM like once every two years or so because I only have the energy to do 
this Herculean effort <laughs> a few times. That's understandable. So, um, yeah. So what happens is um, I don't prep. I'm an improv DM. What I do is I wake up 15 minutes b- before the session. I brush my teeth, and that's my prep. That 15 seconds, I'm in the bathroom before the game. That's all my prep for each session. <laughs> it's just like, let's do it, baby. But like, I just do this. I just do this as a hobby. And the fact that I have blundered partially into the professional scene is just uh, a stroke of luck. Or rather, like people <laughs> appreciating what I write. Yeah, man, you write some really interesting stuff. Like, certainly concepts that no one else seems to cover. My main contribution to the homebrew scene, aside from my own homebrew, is um, have you been told about um, the balance adjustment that I've done? Uh, no, I haven't. Right? Uh, I'm the, I was the, I, I'm the mechanical slash balance consultant for the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets. Uh, the prism, if you're familiar with that, and the armor, armor smith's guide, armorer's guide, I believe. Oh wow! So like I'm one of those, but like since it's not my username, people are like, "Hey, who's this guy?" Armor's handbook. There we go. Under which name? Um, Nicolo de la Merced. So I'm behind the front cover. Uh, okay. Because yeah, I mean, I spoke to genuine, um, but yeah, we never got into like. Um, anyone else being involved in the projects? So what happened was that um, when he was done with the project, right, we blocked off like three or four hours, like straight of me just like grinding through his work, just balancing all the mechanics on it. So the final tuning on it is what appeared in the book. I see. Like I do, like you're familiar with the Discord of many things, of course, like we're both in it. Yeah, yeah. But like... um, like, you know how someone does criticism of each piece, right? Like, I just do that en masse and just, like, go, just, like, tear down swaths. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I get, I get literally, um, I literally get paid just for criticism. Can you imagine that? That's wild, dude. That's pretty insane. Like, I honestly had no idea. Right? I'm, it, it's, it's really funny because, again, as, as I told you, I'm a hermit, right? But, like... <laughs> Uh, most of the classes currently on the curated list, I have heavy involvement with. You mean the curated list on uh, the Reddit? On yeah, on Reddit on Earth Ah, yeah. uh, okay. Like the the Dragon Knight that's been released recently. A good portion of that was my adjustment. I wrote the main subclass for it, the Rider Practice. Oh shit! That's why I'm playing in my uh, in my game. <laughs> <laughs> there, then you're playing my work. You just you just wouldn't know it because I'm barely, I barely exist. I'm like a phantom. Yeah, man. Like, uh, it definitely sounds like you're the ghost in the machine. <laughs> right. But yeah, I'm just telling you because there's no way that you'd be able to clean that without being told it. Oh yeah, man. Like I had no idea. Right? <laughs> it's invisible. But that's impressive. But I'm very happy with that because I only do home brewing as a hobby. I'm not in it to make any money or get any fame. It's just something that I appreciate as an art form. I, I, I actually do homebrew commissions also, which is something that I think that I'm the only one in this circle to do it. Because it's quite difficult to do homebrew commissions. Yeah, I've only heard of a couple people who even consider it, and that's only for like spells like, or something. Yeah, I do subclasses mainly. That's a lot of work. So, like a, most of, most most of the subclasses in my drive, if you look through it, those are a lot of those are commissions. Maybe fifty percent of those are more are commissions. Yeah, because I remember seeing like on uh, the path of the calamity, you have a little uh, like created for. It was the designed for created for, yeah. Because hmm. that's the person that paid me, so I was like, you know, I should at least put their name there. They commissioned this piece. They, they brought this into existence, right? <laughs> Absolutely. But the Path of the Calamity, they, they, they just told me, hey, I, I want a barbarian that does AOE, like nothing else. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> well, buddy, here you go. I'm one of my best works yet, just for you. Yeah, man, that's really fun. <laughs> a lot of your work is like, it just comes from a very fun angle. 
like yeah the uh thousand face rogue hundred face rogue yeah i'm pretty proud of that i would rewrite it differently these days because that was written in 2017 oh. which is three years ago i am so much better than i was three years ago it's not even close but that was good right because what I aim for with a piece of homebrew is that the player gets a different play style. Mm -hmm. I want each particular homebrew to be played in a unique way from the normal subclasses. Exactly, yeah. Like, that's definitely the feeling that comes through. There's two types of homebrew uh, mechanically. Well, I say two types of homebrew. There's two types of mechanical design. Either you design to fit the theme perfectly, in which case your mechanics might be a grab bag, right? It might be like several features that just reinforce the theme, but don't work together gameplay wise. Sure. Or you go for a gameplay angle, then you just try to express the theme while getting the gameplay as unique as possible. And that's what I aim for the second one. Did you ever get the chance to glance through the astrologer? Yeah, I did, man. That looks really fun. What do you think? Like, I like the, um, main casting mechanic where it's like you don't have spell slots you're just spending turns essentially yep the thing is that i would i couldn't write a caster that that's just a normal full cast or a normal half caster because that takes so much mechanical budget and when you do <laughs> that it's difficult to get extra identity out of it the, your mechanics have to be pretty small to support full casting mm. yeah full casting is like a robust system all right like it gives you, it gives you like just being a full caster by itself. Say you were a full caster with a decent spell list and you were, you have no other features. You're just a full caster with a decent spell list. Let's say one D8 hit dice. You'd still be stronger than most marshals just because you're a full caster. Yeah, true. And that's so sad. Yeah, because it's so versatile that so much of its power just comes from itself. Like you don't really need much else. So what happens with a lot of full caster brews is they end up very they end up very plain. Because if you see the full casters in the PHB, some of them only have two or three features and that's it in their base class. That's yeah. it. Sorcerer just has meta magic. That's it. Yeah. And one of those features is usually a ribbon anyway. <laughs> yeah, one of those features is a ribbon anyway. But look um you look at uh you look at Druid. Druid's so packed, right? But oh, most yeah. of those features are not that big a deal. People, people place a bit of stress on Wild Shape, right? But Wild Shape's mostly utility, unless you're Moon Druid. Like, all you do with Wild Shape is turn into a bird or turn into a rat and scurry around. You never use that for combat unless you're Moon Druid. I suppose. I mean, it is free hit points. Yeah, but you'd never use those because you can't cast while using those hit points. Uh, unless you have something already cast that, like... I know, like, yeah, yeah, like let's say you have call lightning, then yeah, if you're turning into a bird and using call lightning, that's probably one of the only niche uses for um, wild shape. True, true. But you can see, you can see recently there's a trend. All of the re most recent druids, they all have alternate wild shape uses because wizards realized, oh man, there's an extra resource here that we can tap into. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't we tap into this with everything else? Are we dumb? No. Time to, time, to, time to sneak it in. Time to sneak in those wild shapes. Yeah, it's interesting how um, wizards have moved more into using up uh, the initial class resources with like in different ways. So like you'll mm. consume spell points, but not for meta magic, say, which is the or to replenish spells. And it's one of those weird things that almost felt like people were doing that in brew beforehand, but it was kind of looked down upon in, when they were doing it. And now wizards have taken over. It's like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, once Wizards does it, everyone does a 180, right? Yeah. People have such standards. They're like, oh, the published, the published work is the only thing that we should judge our brews by or so on, right? <laughs> should never do this or that because Wizards hasn't done it. But the moment Wizards does it, everyone's free game. The moment Hexblade came out, everyone started tacking on charisma weapons. Yep. Ah, uh, the hypocrisy. <laughs> uh, it's fine. That's just the nature of artists as a community. That's a good way of looking at it. Right. Yeah, let me just link. Let me just link. Um, let me just link the work that I've worked on. Oh hell yeah! Um, as a consultant, because I feel like you actually—that's probably more interesting than me as a home brewer. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a little interesting. Not yeah. that me as a home brewer isn't interesting, but like it's a lot, right? <laughs> so these guys. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm familiar with the first two. Yep. The last one's by Vorpo Dice Press, who I believe is in charge of Mythic Eberron currently. Um, the Almaroon's Almanac, but I, I don't work on that because I'm only um, I'm a consultant for classes and subclasses, and those are more anthologies and monsters. So I wasn't I didn't work on those. But this is this is Vorpo Dice Press. It's Almaroon's and um, so on. Right, because yeah, I've spoken to obviously genuine. And um, I was in the middle of, well, I'm still in the middle of talking to uh, Izzy as well. Um, and I think Izzy's worked a bit on Almarins. Yeah, yeah, Izzy's fantastic, by the way. Izzy is the patron saint of Discord of many things. <laughs> so true. Because um, I, I, I used to critique work there constantly from 2007 to 2018, but I got so tired of it. And Izzy's the one that took over for me for the most part there. Izzy's fantastic. Yeah, we were talking a lot about um, like class design and system analysis, um, mm -hmm. but we ended up like just talking for two hours about one thing, and we thought, okay, well, let's try and record some more stuff. <laughs> I did the tuning for Disciple, also, if you're familiar with that. Oh yeah, um, by Rain Junkie. No, Disciple by Izzy. Oh, by Izzy. Sorry, I always get him and Rain mixed up. <laughs> Rain's Dragon Knight. So when you think Rain, just think Dragon Knight. Exactly, yeah. I, I feel like every every home brewer at the top or middle top level has a signature class. It feels that way. Because <laughs> right? mine is astrologer. But I also wrote Philosopher, which was in the um, archive, if you've read that. Because Philosopher's whack. I think you, you've probably seen it before. It's one of those ones I might have encountered, but I didn't necessarily save. You didn't read it, that's <laughs> fair. It's the six, it's the six mad caster it can cast every spell in the game almost but it requires oh, wow. all six stats which is horrible it was a thought experiment people were like hey i bet you can't write a class that requires all attributes and i'm like just watch me watch this hold my beer hmm. so you've led a very interesting uh history and career over your time in homebrew um obviously it sounds like people probably have seen your work without even realizing it yeah, it's it's very it, it's likely that you, it's been it's in the subconscious, the collective consciousness of homebrew, <laughs> right? Definitely, and like you say, like so many uh, homebrewers have their signature homebrew, uh, and usually you've been involved with it at some point. <laughs> yes, for well, at least for the Discord of many things, because I don't venture outside the circle. People people look for me. I don't look for people. Uh... I'm like the Oracle of Delphi. You have to climb a mountain, talk to me to get the criticism on your work. You're like, yeah. you're like Oracle. What? What? How do I balance this feature? And I'm like, here you go, divinely inspired by the gods. I will adjust this feature for you. Now go back <laughs> down the mountain again. Everyone gets one. <laughs> Everyone gets one, right? I I actually have that rule. Everyone gets one. <laughs> Partially, because um, when you when you review hundreds of homebrews at a time, right, that in public, like in Discord of many things, there's only so much you can help a writer before their work becomes your work. You get me? Yeah, yeah. So I I I re I, I only give one mechanic at most to each person, so that they don't like just have me write their work for them. It's important to let people grow at their own pace. Yeah, absolutely. And it's almost harder to determine like what piece of advice you can give someone that will let them like flourish without you like coddling them. Yeah, yeah right. I, I'm very careful with new home brewers. That's the most fragile state for a home brewer when they're new to the thing. Because um they've when the home brewer writes their first home, right? They've mustered all of their will to write this thing. They've they've given it everything they can. They're like, oh, I think this is the best that I can possibly do. So to see that to see that be given into public and see people laugh at it or to jeer at it, that's that's painful to me. Mm. It's unacceptable. That shouldn't be the behavior that we have as a community. 
Absolutely, because I mean, all you're doing is just crushing someone's dreams. <laughs> yeah, you're crushing someone's hopes, right? And like, we don't need we don't need the people that be, that that eventually become good or top home brewers to be people with crushed hopes. We don't need only the people that have enough fortitude to weather that sort of thing. We want people with good artistic sensibility. That's more important than anything else, right? Absolutely. You want them to have the artistic sensibility to write what they want to write. So I'm just uh, taking notes and keeping track of what we're talking about. Yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm intentionally, like I said, since you probably know nothing about me, I'm intentionally giving you the information that you probably would have researched beforehand. Like when you're talking to genuine, you could all, you can easily research what to talk about, right? Oh, exactly. Like yeah. the Compendium <laughs> of Forgotten Secrets is massive. Mm. Everyone knows the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets. Awakening. Hell yeah, man. Got to have the awakening at the end because the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets, that was an amateur work. <laughs> Compendium of Forgotten Secrets Awakening. Now that's a professional work. That's a work you'll find in bookstores. That was the truest version of his work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I believe the one that I actually purchased in the end. It's funny about Genuine because, um, so when he was writing the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets, he had a pretty easy time with it, right? Because he wrote all those subclasses out of passion, see? Mm. And then he just, all he did at the end was he assembled them into a work that could be sold. Like he packaged them together. But um, for writing his newest book, he had to write it from scratch. So it's much more difficult on him. If it's taking a mental toll on this man, He's being broken and battered by the winds of homebrew. <laughs> oh, God. Because <laughs> writing a book from uh, writing the material and then turning that material into a book is different from trying to write a book from the outset, if you get me. It's, they're completely different processes. Oh, yeah, because he wrote like all of the Warlock subclasses before he ever thought about making the book, right? Yeah. He wrote them beforehand. Yeah. And then he just added a few more. So that was trivial for him. I, I won't say trivial. He obviously worked really hard on it. Oh, yeah. That was easy-ish for him. Like, he was able to do that with minimum hassle. But this, that he's working on a completely new venture from scratch. And I can only say I feel sorry for that man. This is why I don't work professionally. <laughs> but you have talked about uh, taking commissions. Yes. I don't know if that's dangerous to bring up on this uh, podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> Feel free, like, if, if someone wants to commission me, go ahead. I'll take on as many people as come my way. The thing is that, okay, so as a home brewer, I only write when I'm inspired, right? Mm. I don't want to force myself to write because that's what leads to burnout. You, you never want to force yourself to write something. Anyway, um, the reason I do commissions is so that people force me to write. I get stimulus to write. The money doesn't actually matter. It's just to prevent thousands of people from asking me to write their work for them. It's just a minimum barrier to entry. That's fair. So I charge, I charge $30 for a subclass. And that's because it takes me roughly two hours to finish a subclass. That sounds like quite a short period of time, actually. <laughs> right. That's, that's my advice to... That, that'll be my advice to any homebrew commissioners. Because people think about it, right? People are like oh, I'm pretty good at writing homebrew. I think that I'll try commissioning, right? Like it might go through your thoughts here and there, but if you're not fast, you shouldn't bother. If it takes you more than two hours and you're charging 30 bucks, then you're, it's not worth it. Let's say it takes you five hours to finish a subclass, which is pretty fair. Like I can't imagine, I'd imagine most people take around that long to polish one, right? Five hours. Chill. But that, that's too much. That's so much, that's so much time worth of labor. Yeah, I mean, most people, you'd probably end up writing maybe a number of things to start with, and then you try and publish it on the DMs Guild, or you go through yeah. one of the paths of self-publishing or put it on a yeah. website, and then there's paying for all of that. Yeah, when that happens, you, have, you, can, you can take your time. You can, you, can, you can grind towards the best product. But when you're, right, when you're working on a commission, you're just working to satisfy one person. And so if your work... If you can't satisfy that person in a, a sizable amount of time, in a, in a short enough amount of time, it's not worth it. You might as well just like work on releasing something slow form. Hmm. So when you're working on a commission, what would you say is like your process? I just, I just write the, I, so first, first off, I just obviously ask the commissioner, Hey, what theme do you want? What mechanics do you want? Right. And then, um, 
and that's it. I just write it. I just um, I find the most suitable, most fun mechanics I can come up with, and I just put them to pen. It's it's my writing process is alien to most <laughs> people because I I write from the top down. I write the flavor text, and then I write each feature level at a time without planning it beforehand. It's like freehand freehand drawing, I suppose. But that's that's absurd, isn't it? From a homebrew perspective, who writes like that? What sort of freak are you? <laughs> I think a lot of people would be very scared about like balance and stuff like that. Yeah, but I'm I'm very confident about the balance of my work, and that mostly comes from experience. Like I have the experience to know what's balanced or not, for the most part. The most important part of balance is that is just that you compare your you compare your work to a mid tier subclass of an existing published work. So say you're writing a warlock, right? Hmm. Just compare it to Fiend or something. Make sure you're about as strong as Fiend in your set. No problem. The most important asset to me as far as writing homebrew fast is that I'm very good at mental playtesting. If you're aware of that concept. Mental playtesting? Yes. So I can I can simulate using the actual homebrew in a fight, like immediately. Like I can just send it against fights in my mind. Oh, and I wow. can balance it that way. I immediately find flaws with the work or so on by mental play testing it. So like uh thinking of like the averages of what the yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever it might be. Like against. let's say I can I can I can straight up in my mind say, hey, I'm gonna make this homebrew fight against four goblins right now. What happens? And that only takes me a few minutes to calculate. You must have a really good familiarity with the content to be able to do that. Yes. I've, I've played almost 100% of the PHP content. Wow. I'd say like 95% of it. Because um, one of the first things I did as a home brewer, I just started grinding Roll20 games. I, I joined every <laughs> Roll20 game I could find, playing every character as different as possible to gain experience with the game. Because I was like, this is a good investment for me. I'm going to gain experience with the game. That is a huge investment. And I don't recommend anyone ever do that because that was miserable. Now I'm good at the game. <laughs> oh, wow. But that's the main reason I'm a balance consultant because I can do, I can substitute for actual playtesting with mental playtesting. Hmm. So I suppose when you're doing a commission, um, obviously the client's going to give you some direction on what they want. Where would you say you find the inspiration for the extra stuff that fits around the things they've asked you for that's needed, like those uh, ribbon features or, say, other key class features? So it depends, right? Like some clients, they'll give me no direction. They'll be like, write me a warlock. And I'm like, e <laughs> that's the worst <laughs> for me because I have to fabricate it from scratch. But if someone goes, hey, I want to play Dante from Devil May Cry, I can do that in a snap, that's no problem. Hmm. Uh, and like ribbons are just, there's an, there's an overemphasis on ribbons, I feel, in the homebrew community. People are like, oh, you need at least one ribbon or your, your class is incomplete or your subclass is incomplete. But that's not true. There's so many PHB published subclasses that don't have any ribbons at all. Yeah, it's almost like kind of a trope in the homebrew community now. It's, it's an arbitrary limit that people place on homebrew that it must not only be combat oriented but who cares especially say you're on a class like bard which has so much utility already <laughs> a bard only has four features and three levels to put those features putting a ribbon there is so difficult yeah that's fair but like here is an example it's a good example here so this is the Armager. Are you familiar with this work? Uh, let me have a quick look. Okay, yeah, yep. Yep. So this is just not this from Final Fantasy XV. But like, you can see that all the flavoring for it being Noctis has been stripped away from it. It's just, it allows you to play <laughs> Noctis. You don't have to be specifically Noctis. Yeah, I was going to say the word Armager just sounded really familiar. <laughs> Yes, it's from Final Fantasy XV, but like I, when I flavor a commission, I flavor it for the default setting. If mm. my if my if my commission won't fit in the Forgotten Realms, I'm not satisfied with it. Yeah, hundred percent. But you can see how complete I aim to be with my work, because like look how look how much this covers the primary tropes of the character. 
Yeah, exactly. Like being able to use like the teleportation, uh, like the manifesting weapons and such. I think this was something that, um, yeah, I've definitely been realizing as I've been going through these interviews. Um, and yeah, I think it comes up a lot in the conversation I had with um, Mike recently from Mage Hand Press and even more so with Izzy, um, is that I think the key to understanding and producing good quality homebrew is in properly identifying the archetype of the character and then fleshing out the tropes of that archetype into their actions. Yes. Because, like, nobody cares about the minutiae. Nobody cares about, oh, this character, like, at one time moved five feet before they did something. No, nobody cares about it. <laughs> they just want the feel of being the character. They want the feel of playing the archetype. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, feel free ask about whatever. Um, but th that's the main thing. That's my main contribution to the community. Like, I've worked on specifically critiquing work, balancing work, and then my own homebrew here and there. Hmm. Because um, it, let's, say, let's say that I only wanted to be a homebrew critic, right? Sure. Like, I'm mainly a homebrew critic. That's my main work as far as homebrewing goes. Nobody would take me seriously if I didn't write any myself, right? Like, who would take a homebrew critic that doesn't homebrew seriously? Sure. Well, actually, I mean, you say that, but there is a long ongoing argument in film as to whether critics need to have made a film to be critical of other films. I, I don't believe so, but I think that in a fledgling medium such as homebrew, it's important because it shows that the critic understands the meaning or the emotion placed behind making a work. Hmm. Well, let's say that homebrew is a medium as big as film, right? Let's sure. say that, oh, we're going to show, we are going to show the companion of Forgotten Secrets Awakening in cinemas uh, <laughs> September 30, right? Yeah, sure. Then being, being a critic without having made a film yourself would be fine because it's wide media. It affects everyone. But homebrew affects a very niche number of people. So you need to have the trust created by being a home brewer yourself to be a convincing critic. Well, I think we are kind of growing in that direction, though. Yeah, we are. We are as the years go by, we're, it's becoming more and more accessible, right? But yeah. I do believe that for now, it's better to be a home brewer than not when you're critiquing work. I mean, you just have to look at like Matthew Mercer, who may be the most famous of home brewers at this point. <laughs> the most famous. I think that's fair to say. Like, I mean, he, no, absolutely. Who's going to question you on that? He created his own like campaign setting and got it published by Wizards of the Coast. The first person to do that right. since like the nineties. <laughs> I, I want to give Matthew Mercer this. None of his homebrew subclasses are so busted that they need to be banned. They, <laughs> Matthew Mercer is, for all intents and purposes a pretty good home brewer by any standard. It's high praise. Right? Because people like to people like to dump on Matthew Mercer, right? People are like, oh, he's just here because he's handsome and he's popular <laughs> and he's a perfect <laughs> human being. Those don't matter in homebrew. All that matters is how good you are at homebrew. And Matthew <laughs> Mercer, pretty good at homebrew, it turns out. Even the things that they say negative about him are still compliments. <laughs> right? They have, to, they have to couch it. They have to be like, oh, I love Matthew Mercer, but I don't think his homebrew is that good. But the I love Matthew Mercer part is very critical to those critics. <laughs> so true. I mean, even down to like the um, Blood Hunter, like, yeah, that thing. Like the Blood Hunter, it's let, let's 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 be honest with each other here. One to one. It's not the best work. It's not the best polish. It's not the best mechanically balanced work. Right. But to what standards are we holding him? Like Matthew Mercer wrote that by himself. As a home brewer, that's pretty impressive. Writing a full class is a difficult feat. Not everyone can write a full class. Absolutely, and his full yeah. class, it's not bad. It's a good seven out of ten. Mm, like even the earlier versions As, still weren't bad. Like when people were bitching about it. Yeah, that's that's really impressive for someone that's as busy as Matthew Mercer. Yeah, to release a decent home brew. I can tell you, if I was Matthew Mercer, I probably wouldn't release a homebrew that good. 
because he's so busy. He has so much. He has so much going on. That guy. So how finding the time to also pursue homebrew? That's really impressive. It's a really, it's a really sympathetic thing. You can sympathize with Matthew Mercer. You can understand that he went through the same process that you, as a home brewer, also went through. Yeah, absolutely. So wow, you share one thing in common with Matthew Mercer. Be happy, everyone. You're a home brewer, <laughs> just like Matthew Mercer. Yeah. And hell, I mean, I know I've released a class on the DMs Guild, and I know it's not as good mm. as his work. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, see, that's that's part of the that's part of the stuff. Knowing that your work isn't perfect is the ideal state of mind for a home. You always want to improve your work as much as you can. When I write a work, I refuse to write a work that isn't 100% of my ability. Okay, so uh, tangent really quick. Yeah. You know how artists tend to hate their old work, right? They're like, oh, I was so amateurish back then. I was so pathetic back then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or so on, like right? You get jaded by it. But I've never felt that in my life. I've always thought the past me's were doing their absolute best when they wrote this. I couldn't have written a better version of this at that time if I tried. Hmm. And that's why I'm very kind to my past selves. I'm like, hey, you, you're pretty good, dude. If you were here today, I'd, be, I'd still be pretty impressed with you. But I'm way better than you because it's 2020 me. <laughs> That's actually a really interesting perspective because I think a lot of people are hard on themselves for like their past right. failings that they couldn't have possibly seen. Right, because you could, when you're an, when you're an amateur home brewer, when you're starting out, you're only so skilled. Your repertoire of skills is only so big. This is the best you could do. The only time that you should be ashamed of your past self is if your past self went like, this is good enough. This is, this is okay. This is the best I can, this is not the best I can do, but this is good enough. Then I can understand if you feel ashamed of your past self. But if you did your absolute best to write something, and then a few years later, you look back on it, you should treat your past self kindly because they did the absolute best that they could at that time. Yeah. I think that's definitely something uh, a lot of people out there need to hear. <laughs> yeah. Like you got to be kind to yourself. I'm talking to you specifically, the one listening to this. <laughs> actually um something oh yeah something i want to talk about specifically mm. um so as a home brewer i've only returned to home brew this year i was at i was on hiatus from 2018 to 2020 early oh wow i didn't write a single thing during that entire time and that's because i believe that the worst enemy of any home brewer is burnout once you burn out, there's no coming back from that. It's over for you, basically. Mm. So when I, I only write when I want to write or when I get paid. So for, for that whole one year and a half span period, I just didn't do anything except for critique work. Because I love D&D and getting burnt out on it, that would be poison to me. That would kill me. So I intentionally just stopped thinking about D&D for years at a time. <laughs> That's sensible. And you don't need to be as extreme as that, but I recommend that if you're ever feeling like you're forcing yourself to write homebrew, just don't do it for a month. Don't do it for a month or two months and you'll feel way better. I think that's really good advice because a, a lot of people tend to just work themselves to exhaustion. Yeah, like we're, we're in a culture that's like rise and grind, gamers. You have to, you have to <laughs> work as hard as you can on this or you'll never succeed in life. That's pathetic. That's, they'll just kill you. People weren't meant to work like that. Mm. And you see it a lot with like YouTubers and like Twitch streamers where I think even uh, Jack Septicai, massively famous YouTuber, recently took like a month break just to get his head back in the game. Like, Fantastic for him because that's what he needs. YouTubers, like YouTubers grind it. They, they work day after day after day. And that's not sustainable. Oh yeah, man. Like it's amazing how hard they work. Considering like all the tropes about how like they're just sitting around making videos for money, like <laughs> those guys work really no, that's hard. Difficult because pursuing any creative art constantly is a battle against yourself. You're gonna burn out if you keep going without stopping. You really have to stop. I I was talking about it earlier, like before this conversation. 
The yeah. only thing more important than the amount of time you spend on homebrew is your inspiration. When you're inspired, you have to use that as much as possible. Your time doesn't matter compared to inspiration. Right when you're inspired, right when you feel like writing. If you don't feel like writing, forcing yourself to write will generally result in something really mediocre. Hmm. The frame of mind I have when I do homebrew is like calligraphy. Are you familiar with Japanese calligraphy? I know of it. Yeah, but like the the intent behind it is just the beauty of the brush strokes. It's not about like depicting the letter perfectly or whatever. You're supposed to infuse the brush strokes with your raw emotion. And that's how I feel about homebrew. Each feature I write is that's like a brush stroke. That's just like one brush stroke. See? It's hmm. not something that I have to grind out. It's something that's one movement. That's a really interesting perspective. Because it's pretty common for homebrew, right? Like you see people like iterate their homebrew infinitely. They grind at it. And I appreciate those people because a lot of people have to work that way. They need to build that to the best product possible by grinding letter after letter after letter, right? I, I've, only re I've only done the initial, the initial release and then like uh, maybe one revision. And like, let's say like, that's like years later. If there's no point in revising something within days of doing it or within weeks of doing it. But yeah. it's especially important with homebrew commissions, as I've mentioned. Because that, that brush stroke style of writing, it allows you to get the feeling that the commissioner wants as fast as possible. See, if I had mm. to grind at it, I wouldn't be able to do commissions. Yeah, it's true. You come from a very different background in terms of how you're producing your homebrews and like just the basis that it is that you're being hired to produce something within X amount of time it's not like you can spend all that time to sit there and polish it and do things in your own time when you feel like doing it it's very much it's work like you you got to do this <laughs> so what i say when a commissioner commissions me is i'll have your work in one week right and mm. what the commissioner expects is that for that one week i'll be working on it bit by bit right sure like oh if you're a commissioner you'd probably think that right i'd probably assume yeah, but no, I spend most of that week doing nothing. And then in one two-hour period during that week, I'll, get, I'll gather the motivation to write their commission, and that's it. So commissioners are always, ask, commissioners are always asking me, hey, do you have, um, how's, the, how's the work going? Or do you have a preview of the work? And I'm like, I haven't started it yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool, don't worry. It'll come before the week's over. I just haven't started it yet. Do you even spend the week like ruminating on it like getting in ideas no, and i don't i don't think about it at all until the time <laughs> comes to write it <laughs> wow <laughs> because like i said it's about the what's more important for me than the mechanics or the theme or whatever it's being in the state of mind to write home hmm. so once i'm in the perfect state of mind to write it i can guarantee that i can write it no matter what the content is but getting to that state of mind requires jostling myself over a week. I can't will that state of mind, that state of divine inspiration to come to me at, to come to me at will, right? I have to wait for it to appear. But yeah, that's how I write. I only write when I'm inspired or when I'm paid. And even when I'm paid, I give myself a window to get inspired, you see? <laughs> so it all works out for me. You're very fair to yourself. I, I probably have the weirdest, most janky workflow of any home brewer that's semi-professional. Well, you're self-employed, so you do you, man. <laughs> you know how you uh, work. That's, that's the funny thing. I have, an, I have a nine to five office job, and this is just extra. <laughs> this is my hobby. If only you could get away with the same thing at work there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine if I, could, if I only had to work two hours a day when I'm super motivated, that'd be sick. Imagine that. <laughs> but no, I have to be there from nine to five, five days a week. You have to grind at it. Yeah. That's not, that's not brush strokes anymore. That's typing or that's handwriting. <laughs> like, you know, those drills in grade school when they make you write cursive letters repeatedly, that's work for you. Oh yeah, man. So if homebrew is a brush stroke, then work is cursive practice. <laughs> It's an interesting take. So I suppose uh, you've also you were talking earlier about um, how you 
uh, have consulted on a number of projects. Uh, I'm curious, which of the projects would you say was your favorite to work on? It's a project that I'm currently working on right now. It's the Gunslinger class that's about to be released by Heavy Arms. God knows when it'll be released, but it's an excellent Gunslinger. Hmm. One of my favorite works that I've worked on. But of works that I've already released, probably the Compendium of Forgotten Secrets, just from the sheer amount of work that we did on that. So, okay, so I, I've already told you about my workflow, right? Like I work on a divinely inspired basis, right? Exactly, yeah. But the thing is, it's different for criticism because they need that, they need that advice now. Hmm. So, and I don't need to be inspired to critique some work because I just need to know how to balance it. I need to know how to write it. It's like chiropractic. I need to know how to straighten out someone's spine. That's all I need to know. <laughs> I'm not making a spine from scratch. I'm not God creating Adam out of the dirt. No, I'm just fixing someone's spine. It's easy peasy. Hmm. Um, so when, when Gen and I worked on that, we spent like a good six hours, I believe, <laughs> just going over every subclass in the book. Like we blocked off a whole section of time. It's like, hey, Gen, meet me at this time and we'll start working on it at this time. <laughs> and for like six hours of pure agony, we went through every subclass in that book. Wow. That's intense, man. <laughs> right. Uh, but I love the I love the people that I work with. If you're a home brewer, there's a good chance that I like you. Unless you said something bad to someone on the Discord of many things, you know who you are. <laughs> hopefully, few and far between. Yeah, hopefully, few and far between, right? If you're listening to this, you must be a pretty good person, right? I'd hope so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I think like of the experiences I've had in Discord of many things. I mean, I've certainly had like one or two experiences i'd maybe categorize as negative but mm. i think even then that came down to like just a misunderstanding of what feedback exactly i was after like so um when you've got someone more focused on like the minutiae of whether or not your class should exist rather than discussing the nature of the class i feel like even then i've just miscommunicated exactly why i was there like <laughs> no right but i feel like that's one of the that's one of the most difficult things to hold gatekeeping because mm. people people go like oh why does this need to exist or give me a reason for this to exist i you don't need to justify that if you wrote something let it happen let it let it come into the world who cares yeah 100 percent. if if you're not if you're not selling your work how important is it that it appeals to everyone why should you be held to the same standards that wizards of the coast is you're an amateur <laughs> let let amateurs do what they want. Let amateurs express themselves. Yeah, I can agree with that a hundred percent. And it's been like almost sad to see like fresh face come in and someone immediately like trying to play that gatekeeping card of like, well, this doesn't need to be a class. <laughs> yeah, they're like they're like, hey, I'm 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 smarter than you. I'm gonna turn you into a hamburger. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no, please don't. Because I can imagine there's probably hundreds to thousands of people that have tried home brewing and then they get like destroyed by criticism and they just leave. They just stop home brewing because it's not fun. Yeah. And to all those people, I say, I'm, um, I say, give it another shot. I'm sure it might be better this time. Yeah, I think definitely. Like you can't necessarily let one experience be the sum total of your experience at it, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I get what you mean. And yeah, definitely, I think under the new leadership as well, it's improved. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. You specifically, Nasa. Thank you for <laughs> forcing me onto this interview. But more importantly, <laughs> thank you for moderating the Discord of many things. I appreciate you, buddy. Yeah, Nasa is a lovely guy. Nasa is fantastic. I'm actually looking forward to doing an interview with him at some point. Right? That'd be funny. We could talk all about his ranger and, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll touch on that, like tr talent tree thing that he's working on. Oh, the talent tree is fantastic though. <laughs> he's always been iterating at it. It's always difficult to write new systems. Cause you're like, you're, you're venturing strange, unexplored lands, right? 
Mm. It's like stepping into the uh, outer planes. Yeah. You go into the elemental plane of fire <laughs> where everyone has nothing but hot takes for your homebrew. <laughs> That's certainly a way of putting it. <laughs> right. Oh. Well, I think this is about a good time for us to chime in with the homebrew challenge. Oh, exciting. So I have here my D20, and I'm Ooh. going to give it... Uh, actually, sorry, it's a D10 I need for this. I haven't got 20 options. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, he pulled out a D20 just for me. Looks like he came up with 20 options. <laughs> yeah, I actually couldn't think of that many. <laughs> well, to be fair, if you think about it, you can easily make a D20 and D10, right? Just like one, two, then three, and then four, then five, six, right? Oh, yeah, that's true. I could, like, cheese it. All right, so I'm going to roll this D10, and I'm going to give you a particular thing I would like you to try and brew on the spot. No problem. Here we go. That is a nine. Uh, could you please homebrew for us a spell? And uh, we can give you a topic or a theme if you like. Oh, go, give me a topic or a theme, because I hate not having a theme to work with. Mm. Go for it. Uh, let's say music. Music. God, that's a broad theme. <laughs> eh, no problem, though. Okay, no problem. Check this out. SL1. Enchantment. One action, range 120. Components, verbal, somatic, material, a music box. <laughs> uh, duration, instantaneous. The spell is called Earworm. As an action, a creature within 120 feet of you must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the creature has a tune repeatedly playing in their head. And whenever... No oh goodness, how do I do this? <laughs> it's a good concept already, though. But I'm thinking, yeah. what's the best mechanic for this, right? Because everyone suffers from earworms. Earworms are the worst. They're, they're like... <laughs> you're, it's when your brain gets infected by a meme, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's all your brain is... All 100% of your brain power is rewired into thinking about this nonsense. I know. It definitely destroys concentration, I feel. <laughs> it definitely destroys concentration, right? Um, but uh, when a creature attempts to cast a spell while the earworm is active on them, they have to make a wisdom saving throw, or the spell, fa the spell fails without wasting the slot, but they have to take another action. And it lasts for one minute. I guess it would be concentration. But the thing is that what I would like for it, actually, is to make it, is to, is to screw with the target. So I would remove concentration, make it 24 hours, and the creature is now immune to spells like detect thoughts because when their thoughts are detected, all it's playing is the earworm. <laughs> there we go. That's that's a much more interesting effect, ain't it? Very and, nice. And you know, let's make it let's make it a ritual so you can screw with as many people as possible. <laughs> now, now for twenty four hours, they'll be thinking about never gonna give you up. It's gonna be like, Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> right? Uh, see, now it's just a troll spell. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fantastic. That's what you want. Right? <laughs> the thing about okay, so you know that people make meme material, right? They make they make work based on jokes or based on popular things, right? But the thing is that you can make a meme brew that's good. You can make a meme mm -hmm. brew that you can make a meme brew that's serious, and then if people happen to get the joke while reading it, then it, it's fine. They'll laugh at it. But you can make a meme brew that's serious. You don't have to make it entirely a joke. You might, if you're going to brew something, you might as well brew it well, right? Yeah, I mean, just look at my work. It's all a joke. <laughs> it's all jokes, right? <laughs> I haven't read any of your work, actually. Link me some of it after this. But yeah, there you go. Earworm. For, for 24 hours, when you get affected by the... Detect Thought spell? Yeah. When you get yeah. affected by Detect Thought spell or a similar feature... They, it doesn't work on you, and then earworm transfers to them. Very cool. It's terrible. What a horrible spell to put into a setting. <laughs> That's interesting, because you could always uh, have a session centered around it where one of your players contracts the earworm, and then they have to deal with it. 
<laughs> it's like, shoot, I have to keep thinking about this. <laughs> or if you're a really awful DM, you just put the MP3 player on repeat near them. <laughs> yeah, you have to play a music box next to them, right? <laughs> but the effect is so weak that um, it can actually be an SL1 or SL2 spell despite being 24 hours. That's what's interesting about it hmm. to me. Because you can reduce, you can reduce, you can reduce effect to increase duration. You can reduce duration to increase effect. Obviously, right? For sure. Well, more I'm trusting you because you certainly know much more about balance than I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. I I don't like to I don't like the rest of my laurels. I don't care about my I don't care about what my reputation is, so to speak. Like obviously I don't care about what my <laughs> reputation is, or you'd probably have heard about me. <laughs> <That's> true. <laughs> I think it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on since it's been like kind of a recent uh theme of discussion, uh going into a little bit on like um class design, uh, if you don't mind. Ooh. Interesting. Do you have anything specific that you want to know about class design or just in general? Well, I think um, one thing I've been trying to figure out in my own head, and a few people have had differing ideas on this, uh, is mm. what we do with the monk. Because obviously the monk has baked in Orientalism that's really problematic. Um, yes. Izzy suggested doing some very dramatic changes to the class itself and saying that basically the class design that we've already got is really bad and how it could be improved. Um and Mike from Mage Press, uh, Mage Hand Press, was saying that, yeah, we should just remove it entirely because it shouldn't be been in 5th edition. Um, but I'm curious if there is a way to make it work in some other sense. Yeah, absolutely. That's trivial, even. You would have to adjust Monk. You just, it, you just have to, without, without even adjusting anything, right? If you, if, you re if you replace key with something like inner power or willpower and then just adjust everything from there, like just make it more, just make it more mundane. It just not, without even adjusting anything, just make it more mundane. Uh, let's, like, let's say, okay, empty body, right? You know what empty body is. You use your key, you become, you enter a state of nothingness, you become invisible, right? Yeah. Just, just flavor it as the mechanical effects. All creatures have disadvantage on attacks against you. You have advantage on attacks against all creatures. Bam. Oh, Very so you, simple. You would go with an approach of reskinning the monk. Yeah, just reskin it. it it's it's the, the the baggage is almost all in the flavor of the monk. If you if you were to reorient monk as more of like an MMA fighter flavor or like a journeyman flavor, it would be trivial. It would take Barely 30 minutes to adjust it to that. Hmm. And I actually, since I've been thinking about it a lot, I think that is the approach that Matt Mercer took. Because if you see um, his latest campaign saying, um, he has the character uh, played by Marisha, Beauregard. Hmm. She's a monk, but the way that he's approached it is the... It's almost like they've taken the Western idea of a monk where it's not like the martial arts Buddhist kind of yeah. monk. It's the like bold headed, like, monk. yeah, like the Christian writing books and copying texts yeah. and yeah. turn that into like a librarian. And like they fight to protect knowledge and they go out and explore and like they're spies and they seek out knowledge in the world of, that's of interest to them. Yeah, see, because think of Monk for a second, okay? There's obviously innate racial issues with it because mm. it's appropriating Asian culture, so on and so forth, right? Exactly. But that's all in the flavor. The mechanics themselves are at minimal fault here. What, what are the mechanics of Monk? It's punch things. It's, <laughs> uh, it's, walk, it's walk across on walls, like parkour. It's... Uh, it's whatever you can you can end the fright in their charm done. Oh, you have a strong will. Isn't that easy to replay? It it would take barely any work. There's no reason to force yourself to do a whole rewrite of monk when the existing chassis is really easy to adjust to a flavor that's not as insulting. Hmm. 
I'm I'm a I'm a big proponent of why do a lot of work when little work do, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Work smart, not hard, right, buddy? Yeah, totally. And yeah, that's a very succinct uh, answer, I think. That works really well. Hmm. So I'm curious, of the official 5e base classes then, uh, are there any that particularly stick out to you as ones that you'd like to, say, rewrite or redesign? I'm actually pretty satisfied with most of 5e's classes. The worst class design-wise is definitely Warlock. But the thing is, fixing Warlock is such a trivial thing. Again, such a trivial thing. I say trivial because it's not that difficult. Anyone could do it easily. So all you have to do, very easy, you make Mystic Arcanum into long rest spell slots so that they can have flexibility when using them. And then you make Eldritch Blast a class feature. Bam! Warlock almost completely fixed two changes. <laughs> so can you walk me through that in a little bit more detail? Certainly. What do you want to know about? So um, Mystic Arcanum, uh, you say long rest spell slots. So currently Mystic Arcanum, you choose one spell of each spell level and you cast those spells at that level only, which prevents you from using those spell slots for anything else, which prevents you from upcasting, downcasting, anything, any of the good things associated with high level spell slots. This is one of the reasons why high level Warlock is unappealing. Because Mystic Arcanum is so bad compared to normal high-level full casting. Do you say, okay, once per long rest, you get a sixth level spell slot, and then a seventh level, and then an eighth level, and then a ninth level spell slot. And then you can just choose your high-level spell, the spells known, like normal. Hmm. That's very easy, wouldn't you say? Like anyone could do that with a minimal amount of work. Yeah, it certainly adds the versatility. But that would make Warlock so much better because now they can cast Synaptic Static at 6th or 7th level. They can cast Fireball at that level. They can upcast Hold Persons. They can so on and so forth. They get the power of high-level spell slots that are afforded to a normal full caster. There is no reason for Warlock to have such pathetic restrictions on their high-level spell slots. Hmm. Because think about it this way, buddy. You're only allowed one spell for each Mystic Arcanum. That means that you're only allowed to choose the best spells for each spell level. True. Because if you choose anything less, that whole slot's basically wasted. Yeah, it is like a really harsh restriction. Yes, and it doesn't need to be there. There's no reasoning for it. It's just because they wrote Path Magic and they knew that they needed high-level spell slots, but the writing for it was sloppy. The execution was sloppy. Hmm. And for the Eldritch Blast as a class feature, um, what difference would that make? Yeah, le level... Oh, simple. Level, level two, it, it, it makes it so that Warlock cannot be dipped, you see? Eldritch Blast would progress with Warlock levels instead of Cantrip levels, you see? Ah. So what this means is the people are now incentivized to keep leveling Warlock instead of saying, oh, I want to be Hexblade 1. Rogue 7, and so on and so forth, which is sad. It's a sad state of affairs for a class to only be seen as multi-class fodder. So by making Eldritch <laughs> Blast a class feature, which forces you or incentivizes you to play Warlock, and by making Mystic Arcanum better, which makes high-level Warlock play more exciting to get to, it fixes almost all of Warlock's issues two in one go. Very easy. Interesting. I'm not fond of sweeping reworks. I like to do as little as needs to be done. There's elegance in doing as little as needs to be done. That's true. Very much like um, uh, Circle's um, Sorcerer re redo. Yeah, I mean, that's, just, that's, that's basically no adjustment. You get mm. more meta magics, you get a self focus, you get spell lists. Yeah, it's very, very small changes that make like such a yes. quality of life difference. The thing is that, um, okay, um, uh, are you aware that Sorcerer is one of the strongest classes in the game? Uh, yeah, man, it's my favorite class to play. Like, <laughs> yeah, oh, so there, there we go. See, I knew I liked you. 
<laughs> but the impression of Sorcerer is so poor. People say it's weaker than Wizard. It's pathetic. It's the weakest fullcaster. They do? Because it's so... It has diffi- you have difficulty playing it. You have to be experienced to play a strong Sorcerer. I felt like it was quite a straightforward class to play. <laughs> you say you think so, right? But the thing is, um, at level one, you have two spells. Hmm. A level one wizard has intelligence plus level spells. They have twice the number of spells as you at level one. At level one, you're only allowed to afford mage armor or shield and then one offensive spell. That's all you get. And that's fine for experienced players. That's trivial. It's whatever. Because you think of it as a role instead of, oh, I'm so limited or whatever. But for new players trying to play a class, they see that it has half the amount of spells and they're like, this is garbage. Why would I play this? So I will say that most of the time that I've played Sorcerer, I would have started at least at like level three, I think, because most of my DMs just skip over. Yeah, there's, there's much less growing pains when you start at a mid level. Yeah. But you can see why they'd get turned off immediately. They would be revulsed by <laughs> yeah. seeing how pathetic it is at the start. But the thing is, Sorcerer, it's the second strongest class in the game. By a wide margin. Would you be interested in seeing um, how I rate the, cl- the class by strength, by the way? Oh, absolutely. Because I feel like you would be interested in that information. For sure. So, here you go, buddy. Tell me what you think about this. Okay, tier list. Uh, tier 1, Cleric and Sorcerer. Tier 1.5. <laughs> um, no, that's important. But I'll explain after. Okay. Um, bard equal to druid. Wizard, warlock, paladin equal to artificer. And tier three, uh, sorry, tier two is barbarian, monk, fighter equal to ranger, and then rogue. Yes. Does, that, does any of that surprise you? I think paladin not being in tier one, yeah. <laughs> right? You'd think so. You'd think from the hype around Paladin, you'd imagine it's tier one, but it is not. Paladin is weaker than Warlock in practice. Even though mathematically, Paladin has the highest damage output in the game. That's what you say, but it has the highest, no, actually not even the highest. It has one of the highest burst damage outputs in the game. Okay, that's fair. Burst is important because over a whole day, a paladin will be doing less than a warlock overall. Hmm. Yeah, because warlock would and you wouldn't have access that. to more utility. I'm sorry? Uh, a warlock would have access to more utility yes. through spells. And the thing is, think about this, buddy. Uh, a mid-level Eldritch Blast can... Do 1d10 plus 5 plus 4 or 5 damage twice. On a hit, it pushes 10 feet. It can slow 10 feet. It can pull 10 feet. All on one at will thing. But only if you've got the right invocations, right? Yeah, only if you have the. Well, you can, you can pick and choose from those, right? But I'm saying That's the at will uh... potential of Warlock, even just strictly in combat, outstrips Paladin. So you would uh, take into account the different invocations that affect Eldritch Blast, even though they are a massive like investment to get all of them. No, you don't need all of them. You just need like one or two. Oh, okay. But so, like I'm saying, yeah. it's possible to get all of them. Right. And if you do have all of them, then your 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 at will tool becomes ridiculous. It becomes a Stanley tool. It becomes <laughs> a Swiss Army knife that does whatever you want it to do at any given point. But the thing is, um, not only that, Paladin has no AoE. Paladin has no area. No, their only AoE is like uh, a beneficial one. And yeah, very high level. Like, yeah, it's defensive. But check it out. A Warlock? A Warlock at... A Fiend Warlock, we'll say. A Fiend Warlock at level 5? They can cast 6 Fireballs per day. Warlock is one of the most efficient casters in the game. The issue is that it can't bank those slots between short rests, right? So it's encouraged to spend them as fast as possible. Yeah. But six fireballs, Klaus, that's twice as many as Wizard. 
Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't have actually thought of that. You see? The only thing that makes Paladin tier 1.5, because from how I'm describing it, I'm saying Warlock is vastly superior to Paladin. But you wouldn't think that because they're right next to each other on the tier list, right? Yeah. The thing is that Paladin has aura of protection. So you want at least one Paladin in every party, even if it's not strictly the best in output. Like if you're min-maxing? If you're min-maxing, yes. Hmm. But as a whole, Paladin's output is inefficient and spends a lot of their resources compared to Warlocks. A single fireball from Warlock hitting two people is 16d6 damage. Do you, you can even compare that to Eldritch Smite or psh, to Divine Smite, pardon, <laughs> to Divine Smite. Because Divine Smite would do 4d8 damage to one target for that same spell slot. Do you see the vast difference in output between those? Yeah, I mean, that's true. But the thing is that Paladin is so glamorous. Paladin feels so good to play that nobody <laughs> thinks about the inefficiency of the Divine Smite because it feels so damn good. And that's good design. Yeah, I mean, when you like let off with a good two-handed weapon that's like got magic on it, yeah. like magical, like maybe even a holy weapon if you're that higher level, and then you just feed all of that like juicy D6s into the uh, Divine Smite, that just feels amazing. Right? It feels amazing, but like Warlock doesn't even need to try to match it. It fires one fireball twice per short rest, and it's easily <laughs> over Paladin already without even trying. It's like it's like the difference between Michael Jordan and another basketball player, right? <laughs> yeah. It's like Michael just shoots hoops. It's whatever for him. And uh, I'm curious why Cleric is in the number one position. <laughs> because Cleric's busted, dude. Cleric single-handedly makes games less interesting. Do you know why? No. Because Cleric is the only class in the game that gains Revivify at level 5. Hmm. So think about this for a moment. What is the worst outcome for a character in D&D? There's only one worst outcome. Oh, well, death. <laughs> yes. So when at level 5, at mid-level... Not even epic. Um, for Paladin to get Revivify, it's level 11. And for Druid to gain Reincarnate, it is level... It's level 9, I believe. Reincarnate's level 5. Mm. Level 9, level 9. Psh, goodness. Yeah. Cleric gains Revivify at level 5, meaning that starting level 5, death is no longer an issue, as long as they save one slot. <laughs> Think yeah. about how disruptive that is from a gameplay standpoint. You cannot make your players, as a DM, afraid of death anymore. Well, I mean, I've talked about this a couple times um, yes. so far, but I think one of the big parts of this is that we have shifted culturally in D&D. As you've gone on over time, character life has become more and more valued by the players uh, to the yes. point that now... You, you can have like a character in critical role die and you've got like people all across the world mourning for that character. Mm. I mean, first edition or second edition AD and D characters, those were expendable. Like you didn't make them to yep. last. But the thing is that cleric. Okay. So say that a DM has no intention of killing the players. Say that a DM is the kindest, most, graceful soul on the face of the earth and they have <laughs> zero intention of killing the players right sure but the thing is how can that dm make the players afraid of potentially dying if at level five this guy can bring them back to life with minimal effort it's a good question it becomes very difficult and not only that aside from revival a cleric is by default, able to fill two out of the three roles needed for combat. So the three roles for combat, just um, I'm sure everyone knows, it's DPS tank support, right? Hmm. And a cleric can be both a tank and a support because it has full armor and it's capable of restoring itself and it's capable of restoring other people. But not only that, a cleric can also be a DPS 
Yeah, I mean, they're designed to sit front and center in the midst of battle. Like, Yeah, Cleric gains spiritual weapon. Cleric has extra attack for the most part. Yeah. Yeah, and not only that, if you're one of the strongest clerics, like, say, Light Domain Cleric, you also have AoE. <laughs> now, so let me, let, me, let me break that down for you. I said there are three roles. So a, a, a Light Domain Cleric or a Tempest Domain Cleric, they can be a tank, a support, a single target DPR, and an AoE DPR in one class. Okay, yeah, so I can I can see why. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's to such an extent, Klaus, that the optimal party for most content is three clerics and one paladin. <laughs> God, you could you couldn't keep that party down. What's funny about that, buddy, is so normally I'd say that a paladin is normally the face of the party, right? They're normally the alpha they're the leader of the bunch because they're charisma they do high dpr they're charming by nature right but in a cleric times three paladin times one party do you think the paladin has any stature in that well i mean they're still high charisma so you might want to introduce them no yes but they, they do the face but like do they have the quality of a leader are they leading these clerics around or are they the person that's behind these other three horrible bishops that are just beating <laughs> everything up? I don't think the clerics would need introductions. But, <laughs> right? What happens in what happens in combat is the paladin, the paladin optimally just stands near the clerics. It's all it's more optimal for them to stand in one place than actually attack themselves. <laughs> Cause yeah, I could almost see them as like a group of like the paladin is just there to be their like escort. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you're here to watch the Holy Inquisition happen, right? You're just here to you're just here to handle all their paperwork. You're here to be their errand boy, right? Stand nearby with your order and say nothing, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's the optimal party for most D and D content, hmm. and it's miserable for the paladin. I feel like like being the paladin, that party would be so oppressive. Yeah, God, I don't even know if I'd want to DM that. <laughs> Right, it would be the the party has no chance of dying. They're all in heavy armor. So as a DM, we all instinctively aim for the weaker, fleshier targets, right? Yeah, that paladin would be going down a lot. We're, we're like, hey, the wizard's in the back row. Let's ambush the back row, hit the wizard, and this will be a tense encounter. It'll rock. What do you target here? Where's the where's the weak point, buddy? <laughs> so yeah, that's why clerics tier one. Every party spot that's filled by a cleric makes that party stronger significantly. Very interesting. Right? You wouldn't think of it that way, right? Not at all, no. Because, like, yeah, there's so many aspects that kind of fly under the radar or get, like, um, like uh, underplayed or under something. Yeah. Mm. But that, that, that's the thing people miss. Cleric is a perfect package with no real flaws. And it's... It's not something that people notice because when, when one person plays a cleric, generally they play the cleric because they want to be the support, right? They want to support the party. Sure. But a well-played cleric can fill every role, can take command of any situation by itself from sheer might. Because, yeah, I think like the, the druid is similar in that respect in that it's, yes. it's given like everything. Like you get the... Up front, being in melee, you get like the the healing spells, the support spells, the damage spells. Yes, yes. you get extra hit. Bars. But that's why. <laughs> but cleric is better in almost every way, and that's really surprising because like cleric has like so few class features. It doesn't need them. I, buddy, buddy, if you remove the subclasses from cleric, it would still be tier one point five if it had no <laughs> subclass. Because yeah, they really don't add that much. Oh, by the way, I didn't explain this, but um, the reason there's tier 1.5 instead of 1, 2, 3 is because these are all actually very close to each other. D&D 5e is the most balanced version of D&D we've had yet, even including 4e. Really? Yes. You'd be surprised. They, they did really good work balancing the game. 
Rogue is the weakest class in the game, but there are very few rogues that would say they're unsatisfied with playing rogue. The people who play rogue, they love it. Rogue <laughs> is their lifeblood. Yeah, it has very strong class design in the way that it like develops its tropes. Yep. I think I was saying to I was discussing with Izzy that um one of the problems with Rogue is that the tropes that it tries to emulate are very narrow, uh, at least in the base class, yeah. which makes the subclasses feel a little bit weird. <laughs> mm. The worst part about Rogue is that the second subclass feature shows up at level nine, right? That's the worst part of Rogue's design. Mm. It's really difficult for players to work with that. It's a very long wait. Mm. But yes, um, as for, yeah, but it, it's very clear, I feel like the hierarchy of this. It's surprising, actually, mm. how, how close Artificer is to Paladin. They're almost exactly equal. Yeah, absolutely. And this is the published version, like the finalized. Yes, yes, of course. I don't use UA at all. Mm. In fact, as a DM, I only play Red is Written, which is really funny. I don't use Homebrew, <laughs> which is really funny because people are like, you don't use Homebrew? What the hell, dude? <laughs> You're a Homebrew. <laughs> you critique Homebrew every day. You don't use anything. <laughs> that is genuinely surprising. But I prefer a published only game. Like the next game I'm going to run, I believe next month, it's going to be PHB only. Wow. <laughs> oh man. People always people always get incredulous at that, but I don't think you can blame them because it, it feels like I should be a person that uses homebrew in my games, right? Nah. It's a funny thing. Um one of my friends played a prank on me recently, right? Oh. Because um, they decided to DM a game. And they're like, okay, so for this game, we're only going to use Kaim's homebrew. That includes you, Kaim. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh how no. would you do this to me? <laughs> the worst part is that everyone in that game has commissioned a piece from me. So it's not like I could say no, <laughs> because that's the chance to use the piece they commissioned. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That's fantastic. Right. It's such a prank. I, I, I got so outplayed by that man. <laughs> oh, man. Well, we're coming up to the end. So I suppose it'd be yeah. nice to close out with, um, if you have any like advice you'd like to pass on to budding brewers out there from your years of experience. I think that I've given enough advice. You should listen to the podcast. <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I think you should listen to the video. Did you see all the premium advice that just passed you by? It was a whole hour and a half, maybe more of advice. Come on, put all that advice. Free advice just for you, buddy. Can't say fairer than that. Well, yeah, man. Well, thank you very much for your time, dude. It's been really great talking to you. It was a pleasure to meet you. You too, dude. It was a pleasure to meet you. It was a pleasure to be interviewed by you. How about that? <laughs> I'll take both. But yeah, definitely. I'd love to speak to you again sometime. I feel like we could go on for hours. Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, I have a lot of... I've, I think that there are very few people in the world who have delved into the depths of D&D 5e specifically, but in me. Yeah, and then, uh, certainly not in like the sheer variety that you have, having gone into like every <clears throat> single type of homebrew. Most people are just sensible and they like specialize in one thing. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing. There are these specialists, right? Like, do you know um, Bunny Gin Master? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He made the plethora of paladins, I believe. That guy's a paladin specialist. His lifeblood is paladins. <laughs> but I am, I am a person with good proficiency with everything, basically. I'm an all-rounder sort of person. Oh, actually, that's a piece of good advice. You should be confident in your own work. Like, there's no reason to self-deprecate your own work before anything else. If you do the, the, the best work that you possibly could, you should be proud of it. Hmm. That is good advice. Yeah, let's, 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 thankfully that advice came like maybe two minutes after you asked me to give everyone advice and I gave a fat, laughy answer. <laughs> As usual, your best work comes at the very last possible minute. <laughs> right? It's, it's when inspiration strikes me. Uh, that's fantastic. But yeah, awesome, man. Thank you again. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll speak again soon and cover even more crazy topics. Thank you very much. Thanks again to Kaim for joining us. If you want to check out Kaim's commissions or homebrews or just follow his Twitter, there are links in the description. 
And last but not least, thank you for making it to the end of the video. Join us next time when we'll be talking to Izzy and doing a deep dive on class design and analysis. Until the next adventure, stay safe.